that's a, I should say that's a success story. Because they're the, they're the best samples I've heard come out of a machine, I tell you. The Mellotron. Just the name conjures up everything from ethereal choirs to scratchy strings, strawberry flutes and evocative vibes. And the truth is, there's probably never been another instrument quite like it, both in terms of its character and the evocative nature of its sounds. It helped create a musical backdrop to a generation or more, from 60s Beatles to 70s Yes and Genesis, and then, after a period in the wilderness, we were reacquainted with its magical sounds, firstly via bands such as Radiohead and Oasis, and right up to recent retro pop artists Caro Emerald and Eliza Doolittle. The Mellotron was originally manufactured in the UK by a small family business who had previously made tools used in the manufacturing of Spitfire fighter planes and Lancaster bombers during the Second World War. After the war, the company, Bradmatic Limited, which was run by Leslie Bradley and his sons Les, Frank and Norman, manufactured tape recorders, amplifiers and such like. And in 1962, after a mysterious order for 70 match tape heads was placed by an American called Bill Franson, the brothers Bradley's interest was peaked to the point where they wanted to see the product into which these tape heads would be placed. Bill Franson and the Bradley brothers duly met, whereupon the Bradleys were introduced to a remarkable instrument. Firstly, it was huge, containing two manuals, an amplifier and speakers. Secondly, its sounds emanated from what was essentially 70 tape players, one replay tape head under each key. Every time a key was pressed, a piece of tape containing a pre-recorded sound was pulled across a tape head and lasted for up to 8 seconds, before having to be released and rewound. Thirdly, and very significantly in this instance, it was unreliable. For starters, there was no internal chassis, so every time the instrument moved, the heads and tape were misaligned. Then there was a small detail of it not having matched tape heads, so each note was played with a radically different tonal variation. Furthermore, to replay a set of different sounds, the tapes essentially scrolled between stations. And to be brutally honest, the method employed here was unreliable to the point of frustration. The Bradley brothers were hugely impressed with the entire concept though, and being engineers to the core, they set about thinking how to solve these and other issues before teaming up with band leader Eric Robinson and Bill Franson to create the Mellotron Mark I. On the surface, this meeting of minds worked extremely well. The Bradley's engineering expertise had improved on Franson's instrument and Eric Robinson owned the studios in which the tapes were recorded. The Mellotron Mark II duly followed a year later and improved further on the Mark I, and indeed the future looked bright. However, all was not as it seemed, and it transpired that Bill Franson didn't actually own the rights to the instrument in the first place. Instead, it was revealed that Bill actually worked as a salesman for US inventor Harry Chamberlain. Worse still, it was Harry Chamberlain who owned the patent to the entire tape replay instrument genre, as well as both of the instruments that Bill had brought to the UK and subsequently claimed as his own. The simple fact was that both the Bradleys and Harry Chamberlain had been duped, and so Les Bradley immediately did the honourable thing of inviting Harry to the UK to try and sort things out. Now one can only imagine what went on during that meeting in 1966, but the culmination was a settlement in Harry's favour for £30,000. A huge sum of money in those days. Approximately 300 Mellotron Mark IIs were made, and from that moment, that trademark haunting sound began to adorn countless records. The first hit record to feature a Mark II was Graham Bond's Baby Can It Be True. The first Beatles record to use a Mellotron was Tomorrow Never Knows. John Lennon had one, Brian Epstein had one, in fact the same one that's owned by George Harrison's family now. The Rolling Stones used one on 2000 Light Years From Home, Tony Banks used it on Watcher of the Skies, even Peter Sellers and Princess Margaret owned one at some point. Indeed, Mark IIs are still considered to be the holy grail of all the models produced, but the chances of finding one nowadays for less than a king's ransom are somewhere between nil and zero.
The Mark II's dual manual, home entertainment styling and sheer weight meant that it wasn't something to be taken on the road. And those that tried faced the consequences. Trying to play a note while the stations were shuttling was guaranteed to have the stage swimming in tape. And even though a padded flight case was made, the wonderfully named Protector Moth. On an instrument of this weight, it was never going to save it having been dropped, so it was clear that as more and more rock musicians gravitated to that sound, a more portable solution needed to be found. The M300 appeared in 1968, and with its single manual, 52-note keyboard and no speakers, it looked like it might be the ticket for gigging musicians. However, it still weighed 100 kilos, and a new quarter-inch two-track tape format and mechanism made it both heavy and unreliable. Only 60 of these were made, but it has a special place in our hearts simply because a new library was created for it. The answer to gigging musicians' prayers was revealed a couple of years later with the M400. This was the singularly most successful selling Mellotron, with a production that ran into four figures as opposed to two or three seen previously. And with this, combined with a return to the 3 8 inch tape format and a new tape frame mechanism which lost the idea of shuttling stations, it meant the user had an altogether more reliable and roadworthy instrument. Each tape frame had three tracks, the most common of which contained flute, violins and cello. Controls on the M400 are limited to an ABC selector for the sounds, plus pitch, tone and volume controls. And it was this simplicity combined with that sound which meant every single self-respecting rock keyboard player in the 70s should play live with a setup including an M400. Indeed, if you were a 70s prog rock keyboard player, an M400 purchase was mandatory before you even got an audition. And despite reports from some quarters of reliability issues, it seemed like the Mellotron was here to stay. It's also fair to say that it saw off every potential competitor during those halcyon days, including the Orchestron, the Optagon and the Byrotron. In fact, every one of these products was usually based around an attempt to circumnavigate the 8 second note limitation completely failing to understand how it, this limitation forced the musician to allow the music to breathe. The orchestron issued this in favour of such a lo-fi sound, we find it almost impossible to think of it as a competitor. And as for the Byrotron and its 8-track cartridges clattering away all the time, well, the less said about that, the better. However, even after seeing off potential rivals, sadly all was not well in Tromland. Firstly, the Musicians' Union didn't approve, and at one point Trons were briefly banned from the BBC. Secondly, the age of string machines and polyphonic synthesis was dawning, and keyboard players wanted something less static and more customisable in terms of sound. However, the real blow came in 1976, when distributor Dallas Arbiter went bust, owing Mellotronic somewhere in the region of £80,000. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the liquidator then sold the name Mellotron. In an attempt to continue in business, the name Novatron was adopted, but the writing was on the wall. The liquidators sold the name Mellotron to somebody else, bless them. Uh, so we carried on, we still built the Mark V as well. We eventually came out with the T550, of which we built four. Uh, and eventually, of course, finance caught up with them. Uh, and yeah, so February the 13th, 1986, uh, it wrapped up. And obviously, it went into liquidation. The liquidator put a different lock on the door. And that was it. We weren't allowed in for a while. Eventually, Les and Norman, the two surviving brothers, because Frank died in 79, um, did a deal with the liquidator that they could have what was inside but one week to clear it. So we went in and all the machinery and stuff was still there, just the same obviously. Um, the machinery was sold for you know, lace for 25 quid, all the rest of it for basically for scrap. And we had a skip outside uh, to put metal in and all of the jigs for building 400s, Mark IIs and M300s went in the skip because we thought that's it, no more. Uh, there's no call for this, it's obsolete, it's going in the bin. 
Uh, with hindsight, it would have been nice if we'd have kept some of that. But uh, you know, the, it just wasn't the time. You know, we, at that particular time, we thought it was dead. You know, I mean, there were in, in the early '80s there were a few bands like OMD, uh, made of Orleans, of course. We got them a 400 and various people, but clearly the the demand was on the decline. Sadly. Since that time, much has been documented about the US company who acquired the Mellotron trademark and inventory. And if you want to know more, Diana Dilworth's excellent melodrama film is a must-buy. However, we feel that as excellent as that film is, it somewhat glosses over the massive contribution the Bradleys made. And the Observer is left with a clear message that with the demise of Streetly, the end of British Tron dominance had finally arrived. Or had it? Because in 2000, we released the world's first Tron plug-in, the now legendary M-Tron, which gave way to the M-Tron Pro a few years later. Sure, there had been sample CDs with Melly sounds on before this plug-in arrived, but this was the first time these classic sounds had all been brought together under one convenient and exciting new format. Both the original M-Tron and the M-Tron Pro are designed around the aesthetics of an M400. And it's fair to say that when we launched the M-Tron, you could hardly give a melee away, particularly in Europe. Now, if we were being arrogant, we'd say that we were responsible for reintroducing that sound to a new legion of music makers back then via that instrument. God knows we had to suffer countless CDs of remakes of Heart of the Sunrise, and we even had a fantastic hate mail from someone accusing us of ripping him off because we'd included those lovely Mark II rhythms. You know, those rhythms which now adorn a wealth of TV adverts and which have featured on heaps of hits. Similarly, those choirs and strings that had become so out of fashion for so long are now a really essential part of any sonic arsenal, and when introduced to a contemporary track, can immediately add a degree of nostalgia and longing that rarely fails what we call the goosebump test. Don't believe me? Well, listen to the flutes on Vampire Weekend's A-Punk. Listen to Radiohead's Exit Music for a film. Listen to Caro, Emeralds and Night Like This. Eliza Doolittle's Back to Front or Go Home. Or Harmonic 33's Moon Par. Kasabian's Empire album. Razorlight's Golden Touch. Lily Allen's LDN. And Eye Monster's brilliant Never Odd or Even album. Quite simply, the list is endless. And we know, because we get the emails all the time. But for us, regardless or not of whether the melee sound is in vogue, we love it. And since the M-Tron release, we have tirelessly sourced Tron tapes from every corner of the globe. And all in the hope of preserving each sound and then reintroducing them to a new generation of musicians. Now, during this quest, we've purchased Chamberlain's Galore, we've purchased Optigons and their discs in abundance, we've procured Orchestrons and Baratrons at costs that defy sanity. But this latest expansion pack for Mtron Pro is unbelievably special, representing a world first and a true pinch me moment for us. The Streetly tapes for Mtron Pro is the first time these original master tapes have left the Mothertron, and we are beyond privileged to be able to bring you this add on pack. The Streetly tapes are different to anything else out there because, as Martin Smith explains, well, first of all, what we wanted to do in working with you was to give as accurate a uh, set of recordings as we could without um, that, that you could put them against the recordings from um, 1963, 1972, and go, yeah, they're accurate. They're absolutely accurate. So what we try to do is the thing that Streetly does is that we do exactly what Les Bradley did, John's father. We use EMI tape where possible. Now this is the old formulation of EMI tape. This tape, possibly the best tape ever made on the planet. It doesn't shed. All the Beatles recordings were done on this. All they do is stick it on the tape deck, put a cloth on it, run it through once and they can play it. Unlike Ampex, which would stick to the head shed oxide. So we still go back to EMI tape because it has the correct it has the correct sound, it drives beautifully and it, it, it just has, we can hit it hard 
in a strange way it'll take a very high level and it just gives you that there's a sort of warm cuddliness to it that you don't get from say a modern formulation of Bass F, well Bass F doesn't exist now, or Ampex, where you, everybody's gone striving for wonderful highs. This tape probably rolls off at 15k. Most original Mellotron recordings roll off around 12k. There's some that, some of our newer recordings are better. I mean, they're, they're probably 16k, something like that. But we didn't want anything more than that. We didn't want anything that it, that 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 had a a falsely high fidelity sound to it. We wanted it to, to to sound as accurate as possible. So what we did was we took a reel of genuine EMI, recorded our sounds onto it, loaded that reel onto the Skeletron, which is a an exposed Mellotron that John built um, twenty years ago. And this is a, a machine that is, is, is an M400, but it's completely exoskeleton, so we can get in there, we can do what we want. And we loaded this tape onto there and got it to play out the sounds. Now, the easiest way would have been to just process it. But by playing it out, you get all the in, inherent characteristics of EMI tape playing over a proper Mellotron playback head. Uh, and any inconsistencies that that exist within that system are also captured. The thing is, people ramble on about master tapes, about owning master tapes, about you know giving you the source recordings. Mellotrons, by the time an M400 got the tapes onto the frame, it was a five generations degradation copy from the master tape. But that is the sound of the Mellotron. It's not the sound of the original recording in IBC Studios in, in London, transferred once onto tape. It's, it's IBC Studios, edited to masters, edited to protection copies, edited to work masters, edited down to actual recordings that go on the tape frame or in the mechanism. And that is the sound of the Mellotron. It's not, it's not this perfection. It's that will destroy the whole thing. You've got to have the bias pops, the odd, um, the odd tuning errors and all that sort of thing have to remain intact to give you back what you're striving for and the Mtron is there to give you as close as possible a Mellotron. Unlike so much Tron material that's come along riding on the coattails of the Mtron and the Mtron Pro and purports to be the biggest this and the most authentic other there is nothing as real and true and as original as this. Unless, of course, you own a Streetly M4000. Because if you wondered what happened to the Bradleys after the company closed, well, despite losing nearly everything in the disastrous and unjust liquidation, in 1991, Les and John Bradley and Martin Smith teamed up to offer Mellotron servicing and the creation of new tapes. Now today, this business has evolved into manufacturing the stunning M4000 Tron. The only modern tape-based Tron that has azimuth alignable tape heads. And the only modern Tron which stays completely true to the ethos of the original, in that it's tape-based and it finally realises a truly reliable and fail-safe eight-station cycling mechanism, all giving the user the feel of a Mark II and 24 of those sounds. Obviously, we've done quite a lot of renovation work with 400s, sometimes Mark IIs, very occasionally M300s, the odd Mark V, uh, but there was a big demand for M400s. And obviously, we're in a way a victim of our own success in that particular department because when you start to renovate machines and sell them for a renovated price, people with unrenovated machines realise that they're worth more. You know, you can't buy them for 100 quid anymore. And there became a point where the, the demand was outstripping the availability of old machines to renovate. So we thought, why don't we have a go at building a new one? Quite a big undertaking. Fortunately, we've got Brian, who works with us, who is a toolmaker. And he had retired from where he worked. So we said to him, 
how do you fancy coming to work for us part time? You know, come and work with us. Uh, which he duly did, and of course, because of that, because he's a, a proper qualified tool maker, of course, he built a lot of jigs for us for making the various parts. And with that, I mean, if we'd have had to do that commercially, it would never have happened. Uh, so we thought, if we're going to build a machine, let's make it special. Now, the M400 was the model that was portable, but the downside only three sounds in one machine. So I thought, what about if we incorporate the cycling? from the earlier machines, like the Mark 1 and 2 and 300, and have a modern control system on it. So we can actually place it accurately and more to the point, move the attack position, because that had never been done before. So we ended up with an eight station machine, which has got 24 sounds in it. Right, if we're going to do this at all, then we'll do it right. So if you take an M4000 now, put it up against a nice condition Mark 2, M400, whatever, you can see the family resemblance is built in the same way. No compromise. It's either right or don't do it. What we wanted to do was try and standardise the parts. Now, an M4000 is a grown up M400. But what I wanted to do was standardise as many parts as possible so we could either make 400s, which we have made a couple of, or we can use the parts to renovate old 400s because they come in all shapes and sizes good, bad, bloody awful, etc, etc. So we decided to make stainless steel capstans instead of chrome-plated mild steel ones because they don't rust and in a thousand years time the cabinet may have rotted away but the capstan will still be beautiful. Uh, and wanted to make them the same. And the 400 doesn't have cycling, it doesn't have a sink tape. So we had to get round the issue that there wouldn't be a sink tape. All the, the Mark IIs and sound effects consoles and M300s all have a sync tape for positioning. So we've got Norm Leet on board, who's a Mellotron owner in his own right anyway, uh, and an electronics genius, a programmer extraordinaire, to come up with the program so we could have a modern chip which would operate this system with a stepper motor, so it would count for itself where it should be. Uh, so in that way, if you take the keyboard off an M4000, it will fit onto a 400. It's the same size. Obviously the cabinet had to be bigger to get the drums in for the cycling, each tape being 60 feet long, of course, no mean feet. What I wanted was a machine that would go through a standard door. Because if you're not careful, it's too big, it won't go in people's houses. So eventually I got some tape drums and worked out approximately what I wanted. So then I thought, right, I've got to make a drawing I drew it on the door, so every time you go in and out, it's right there, we kick it, the drawing's still there, and the frame penciled in inside just to get the dimensions right. Built a prototype, uh, it worked, and after a lot of um, protracted development of the cycling system, because that program is so damn complicated, just to move tape shuttle and mechanism from one place to another, so many different things to take into account, but it works beautifully. Show your eyes there. Eh? Tell me which one you're listening to now. Are you ready? Yeah. 
Nelson. And the only reason I can tell that is because I can hear the tapes. Yeah. Ah, that's, <laughs> that's cheating. That's cheating. Cheating.